continual progression in terms of your growth. Every day you're developing. God wants you to develop. He said the path of the just is as a shining light. The next verse says, but the wicked know not at what they stumble at. Because when it comes to the wicked, their own path is darkened. There's darkness. And therefore they don't know what they'll be stumbling at. They'll keep stumbling here and stumbling there. And on the premise of that, verse 20 said, therefore my son, attend to my word. He said, incline thy ear unto my saying. He said, don't let it depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. For they are life unto those that find it. And it will be health or medicine to all their flesh. Therefore, deliverance is in the world. Healing is in the world. Lifting is in the world. Breakthrough is in the world. And now you can understand what the Bible says. He sent forth his word. And he brought it. And he healed them. So if I embrace the word, then it's going to be well with me. Somebody say that. If I embrace what the word says, it will be well. Today we're going to be looking generally at the concept of curses. A lot of the times in the Christian world, there's a lot of argument as to whether people get cursed, whether people don't get cursed. Some people look at it as just some, you know, African movie that somebody's talking about, or some Indian voodoo that they're bringing up, or some Asian stuff, you know, that kind of thing. But the truth of the matter is that curses are real. Curses are real. Are you understanding? Whether they're generational or not, they are real. And you understand? That's one of the key things we should need to start from. Because what exactly is the curse? A curse is actually a declaration over a life in the context of evil. You, you, know, you can call it a wish of evil over somebody, or you can call it something that is done to ensure that evil follows a particular life. So it is that which brings evil upon somebody. I mean, the Bible is filled with evidence that curses are real. So curses are real. Whether we agree that they are generational or not, one thing is clear, they are real. If God could say to us in Genesis chapter 30, talking to the children of Israel, and he says that, I have called heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I place before you blessing and cursing. That means curses must be real. Because if they were not real, then God will not say, I place before you blessing and cursing. Then he said, life and death. That means that blessings produce life and curses produce death. And you understand what I'm talking about? So they are real. Whether we want to agree, whether they're generational or not generational, one thing is clear. Curses are real. The same God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he said, in blessing I will bless you. If we agree that blessings are real, then curses must be real. Because in that very same scripture, Genesis chapter 12, he said, I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse them that curse you. That means curses are real. Are you following what I'm talking about? Uh, the Bible says in another scripture, I think it's in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33 of it, it talks about the blessing of God in the household of the just, but that his curse is in the place of the wicked. So curses are real. Whether we want to agree with it or not, the scriptures say that they are real. No one demonstrated to us that curses are real. When you read what happened after the flood, and the Bible talks about the fact that after that ark rested on Mount Ararat and Noah was able to come out of it, one of the first things, in fact, the very first thing it did. Now, let me put it this way. Let me give you a little background of this. Many people think, Apostle Anna, that when Noah was going to the ark, that he took two of every animal, male and female. That's not true. The Bible never said that. Go and read it. The Bible never said that Noah took two of them. The Bible said of the clean beast, he took seven. Yeah. Wow. Everything that was clean, he took seven of that. Yeah. And the unclean beast, he took two. Yeah. That's what the Bible said. Yeah. And the thing about it is that Noah did not even go to the bush and, and start to gather all the animals. No one was over 500 years old, you know, at this point in time. Are you understand what I'm saying? The Bible says 
said it was literally the Lord that literally moved on those animals and those animals found the ark. That's a message for a different time. Sometimes we're struggling too much and harassing ourselves over something that we have not found. God, it doesn't take God anything much to breathe upon someone, to breathe upon people, to breathe upon an environment and cause them to move in a particular way. Somebody say amen. So it was God that actually led those animals to come to the earth. And Noah took seven. That's why the Bible could say he took. Because when they came, Noah just selected. Okay, you come, you come, you come, you come, you stay, you come, you come. You know, do too. Are you getting one of the unclean one? Because the moment Noah arrived and came out of the ark, the first thing Noah did was take one one of every clean beast. So that the clean beast, now what was left of us? Six. He took one of every clean beast and sacrificed them unto God. And it was a burnt offering that came unto God. Bible said God smelt it. It was wonderful to the nostril of God. And on the context of that, God said, the earth will no longer be cursed for man's sake. That tells you something. That sacrificial seed goes a long way in destroying curses. I know what I'm saying. Immediately, the Bible said, God smelt it. God smelt it. And God said, the land will no longer be cursed again for man's sake. He said, because of this thing that you have done, he said, day and night will remain. He said, winter and summer will remain. He said, seed time and harvest will remain. And you understand, if you go back and read in Genesis, we read that already, where the Bible says, thorns and thistles will it bring on to you. If you go to the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 55, God turned that around. And I believe it's because of what Noah had done years before. God said that my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But I do not want it to be that way. Somebody said, was it written like that? That's my paraphrase. Somebody said, why would you paraphrase it like that? Because of the next thing you said. He said, but as the rain and the snow comes from heaven, who comes on the earth and does not return there, he says, so shall my word that is gone out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me for it. You know, it's an accomplish that which I said. Are you following what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, okay, let me just show you this. Uh, there's something I want to quickly show you. No, I just don't want to quote it. I want you to see Isaiah 55. I'll quickly look at it. If you look in there in verse 10, it said the rain come. It said, I'm making it water in the earth. I'm making it bring forth and bought. Watch that. Watch what it says now. That he may give what? Seed to the sower. And give what? Bread to the eater. And then do what? Multiply the seed so then it says so shall my word. That was the missing link that many people don't quote. It said he will cause it. I'm doing this thing. And then when this happens, it will not return for it. Now watch the next thing that it says. It said, look at you accomplish that which I please. It will prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. Look at it says, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands instead of thorn. You remember Genesis? Thorns and thistles shall it bring. It said, instead of thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the prayer shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut. What is God trying to say? That God is in the business of reversing curses. Yes, curses yes, are real, yes. but God is in the business of turning them around, yes. of canceling them, of breaking them, of reversing them. Somebody say amen. Yes. So we see that God himself showed us that curses are real. Noah showed us that curses are real. Moses showed us that curses are real. When he told them, you know, God said, I should place before you blessing and cursing. That means it's real. Are you following what I'm saying? God, Moses told them. Anybody remember in Deuteronomy chapter 28? 
When Moses gave them the blessings, and he said, if you'll do this, and if you'll do this, he said, the Lord will bless you, the thing will overshadow you, but if not, all these curses shall come upon you. Yes. So many curses are real. Are you following? Yes. Jesus demonstrated to us that curses are real. He did that. The Bible said he spoke to the fig tree. He said, no man eat food of thee hereafter. And then the Bible said that Peter called into remembrance the next day. When they saw the fig tree dry, he said, Father, he said Master, the tree that you cursed. Did you see that? That you were cursed. It's withered away from the root. That means curses are real. Remember we said that blessings produce life. But curses produce death. And you get what I'm saying? They said, no man shall eat fruit of thee hereafter. And that was it for that particular fruit. So Jesus showed us that curses are real. That's what the Bible said. Is it not Jesus who said, bless them that curse you? Now, which means if you were to bless them that curse you, then it means that curses are real. Jesus said it. And the Bible said he's the one that redeemed us. The essence of redemption is to make sure that every dimension of curse is broken. That's why we have the new creation here. To make sure that the curse is broken. Anybody remembers that the apostles demonstrated it. It was Paul who spoke to Elimus the sorcerer and told him you'll be blind for a season. Bible said immediately the stuff came on up and the man was unable to see because they showed us that curses are real. Yes. Is it not the apostle James who said with the same mouth you bless and you curse? So if curses were not real, James would not have put that part of the equation there. He would have just simply said with your mouth you bless and he wouldn't have mentioned anything about curses. But curses are real. They are real. And we need to be able to appreciate that. Peter spoke in 2 Peter chapter 2, talking about the depravity of men and called them cursed children. In 2 Peter 2, verse 14. And so he's showing you that curses are real. But there's something that is important. We cannot use 45 minutes or so to say everything that we want to say about curses. Somebody said, I think Pastor Apostle Anna gave me 45 minutes. No, she gave me way, way more than that. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about. But that's the time I want to use. I don't want to use much more than that. And you get, so that we can get this thing and then concentrate on some other stuff. Somebody say amen. Yeah. Are you following me here? And so we, we, we can say everything, but there's some things that we can talk about in the context of curses. Now, let me say this to you. Even though curses are real, all curses are consequential. Did you hear what I just said? What did I say they are? They are what? They are consequential. They don't just happen. So go with me to Proverbs chapter 26. And that is why, that is what makes it possible for us to deal with them. If they just happen like that, then we will not be able to deal with them. But they don't just ask, they are all consequential. There is no curse that did not come as a result of something. So look at Proverbs 26, verse 2. He said, uh, in fact, I can start from verse 1. He said, as snow in summer, and as rain in harvest, so honors not simply for food. Then he said in verse 2, as the bird by wandering, and the swallow by flying, so the curse. Curseless shall not come. That means a curse cannot come without a reason. People don't just get cursed. Curses don't just come on people. Every curse is consequential. They don't just happen. All of them follow an action or a deed. They are never spontaneous. They are always triggered something triggers the curse. Wow. And that is part of the reason why we can stop it. Because if nothing triggered it, then it will be hard to do. But because something triggered, therefore it is not permanent. Right. Amen. You hear me what I say? Because something triggered it, then it is not permanent. Did right. you capture what I'm saying? It is temporal. The curse is temporal. Did you hear what I just said? It is temporal. 
It can't stay there. <laughs> hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Glory be to God. Now let me give you an idea. <laughs> hear this and hear this word. Well. No curse. Did you hear me? Listen very well. This will help you. No curse has what it takes to be permanent. Even when the cursor is God. I said no curse has what it takes to be permanent. Even when the cursor is God. I'm saying, those of you who are watching us on, on, on TV, I'm saying now, capture it now. Those of you sitting in your home, when you, whatever it is that you're doing, capture this. This will change your life. No curse is permanent. It doesn't have what it takes to be permanent. Even when the cursor See, I'm a Nigerian. We have ways of creating words. Even when the cursor is God. Even you know when the one who put the cursor is God. Now let me say something. I'm not going to help you clarify that. Yes, 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 Understand a little bit. How many of you know Numbers chapter 23 verse 19? It says, For God is not a man that he should what? Then the Bible said, Neither the Son of Man that he should what? Repent. Then you go to Exodus chapter 32 from about verse 7. A man named Moses told God, Repent of this evil that you have taught against your people. And then the Bible said, And God repented. So does the Bible contradict itself? No. Now one of the key things you need to learn is that the Bible never contradicts itself. Even when it looks like it is contradicting itself. Now I'm going to deal with that in just a couple seconds. But before I do, you're already in Proverbs chapter 26. So take a quick look at the scripture. That same Proverbs 26, look at verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his fault. You see that? You understand? Uh, but let's that also be like unto him. So that you don't like him. Look at first part. Answer a fool according to his fault. Lest he be wise in his own conceit. So that sounds what? Sounds like what? Contradiction. So it sounds like the Bible is contradicting itself. So one of the key things you must learn in your study of the word of God is that the Bible never contradicts itself. It might appear like it contradicted itself to you when you first take a look at it. Take your time, look at it again, and you will see that there is no contradiction. The first one gives you this. It sounds like a contradiction. Answer not a fool. I said, answer a fool according to his folly. You know, so that he do not think he's wise in his own conceit. So the setting is totally different. So don't stop and answer not a fool and then answer a fool. You will get yourself in trouble because you have missed the essence of that scripture. The essence of the scripture that you just read is demonstrating to you the power of speech. You understand what I'm talking about? Let us assume there's some of us in those days who were a little older to remember there was a guy in Port of Spain, Frederick Street, Lower Frederick Street, especially around Queen, all the way from Woodford Square going down, called Rambo. Anybody remember Rambo? He used to walk around naked. I remember there was somebody who said, oh God, they wish they could take Rambo home and just kill him up and give him day. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many of you remember Rambo. You remember Rambo? Okay, good. Now, I want you to capture it. Imagine you walking down Frederick Street. You now come out of your office. You're working in one of the ministries or you're working in the bank. You come out and around and start to talk to you. You're that fool. You do this, you do that. You, do, you feel like that. You, you feel like that. No, 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 no. Now, think about it very well. If you start up and start to argue with Rambo and say Rambo is not a fool, what are you to Rambo? Do you know I work in this one so please? I go up my CXC passes. I got my A levels at home. Think about it. What do you think people will, how do you think people will see you? They think that you and Rambo are in foolish league. What are you school? That is the first one, Proverbs chapter 4, 24, 26 verse 4. Answer not a fool, so that you will not be like him. The essence is because Rambo's speech is not going to do anything to you. 
How about we going back to school now? Yeah. So it was children's school going to be restarting about three weeks time. Yes. And then suddenly somebody, you know, some they called your parents, teachers, that you should come to the school setting before school resumes. And while you're there at Goodly Miss, so to speak, Goodly Miss, who just came in from the United States, you know, that kind of thing, which you, you know, American accent comes over and tells all of you in the parents teachers meeting that those of you that your child's gonna be coming into form one, you know, form one, lower part of the school, we are gonna be presenting this book to them. This is a book that is going to help them understand their sexuality. And you know, they would need to understand that you can have families that have just two mothers. You can have families that have just two fathers. You can have families that have all that. And this is important because we don't want the children, you know, to be prejudiced against anybody. And so we're going to make sure that your children learn this, but we just want to inform you so you will know what we're teaching each other. Now, all of you sitting down there, so you're not there and say, oh, wonderful, my children are going to learn and learn to all of you do this. What are you going to do? You're going to stand up and you're going to come up with yourself in all your blazing guns and say, nah, that ain't taking This is Trinidad. That is the final answer of food. Paul said, 
He said, when the time came, God who already called me straight from my mother's womb. You understand? He did that. So God did such and such. Anybody remember Jacob and Esau? Why do you think God called Jacob and not Esau? Is it because Jacob was smarter? You understand? Is it because Esau sold his birthright? No. All those things came after, but before, while they were in the womb. God told their mother, he said, two nations are inside you. The younger one will be the greater one. The younger one is the one that I'm going to elect and choose. So it had nothing to do with porridge. Did you capture it now? That is called the what? Providential will of God. And in the context of the providential will of God, if God anointed you to function as an apostle, from your mother's womb and you refuse to be born again when you stand before the judgment seat of God God ain't going to ask you if you got born again he's going to ask you about the apostolic grace that is on your life because his gifts and his calling are without repentance what so happened is that you use that same grace that is the same grace you use to become the greatest soka monarch that is the same grace you use to become the greatest pig that is the same grace you use you know, to become the best pilot. That's the same grace you use. So I'm going to ask you about that. Because that is his providential will. So as it relates to his providential will, God never repents. If you read Numbers chapter 23, it had to do with the providential will of God. The children of Israel were messing up. And if you read the whole thing, God said no enchantment, no divination will prevail on them that God doesn't see evil over them. Therefore, in the context of his providential will, it doesn't matter what happened, what didn't happen, God not going to change his mind. He doesn't repent. And yes, his providential will is always good. Amen. And because it's always good, he doesn't need to repent for it. Amen. However, his consequential will has to do with what man has done. So man goes this way, God operates as a consequence of what you did. Therefore, because you moved in a particular direction, God now is vexed. You understand what I'm talking about? Because you move so. So as a consequence, certain things come upon you. As well, that kind of thing. But here it is. God can repent from that. If you repent, number one. Yeah. Number two, somebody can stand in the gap yeah. as an intercessor yeah. and speak to God concerning you like Moses did. Yeah. So that would take away yeah. that which God was doing. And therefore yeah. there is a repentance yeah. Yeah. from his consequential will. Yeah. Because his consequential will is tied to your actions or inactions. Yeah. But his providential will is never tied to you. Yeah. Captured. So from his providential will, he does not repent. From his consequential will, he can repent. So you see, the Bible does not do what? Contradict itself. So that is why the cursor, even if the cursor is God, we can change. Go to Genesis chapter 4. Oh Lord, we've talked a lot today. Oh Genesis 4. You get anything out of this so far? Yeah. You get anything out of this? So yeah. bear with me here. Genesis chapter 4. Anybody remember a guy called Abel? Yes. Anybody remember his brother called Cain? Yes. Okay. So what happened? Cain killed Abel. Abel yes. After he killed Abel, what happened? God did what? God did what? Cursed him. Look at it from verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now at thou curse. Can you see that? Yes. From the earth. So curse coming. Are you seeing it? Yes. Which had opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from the hand. When thou tillest the ground, watch, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Do you see that? A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. Is that not a curse? Yes. I said, is that not a curse? Yes. Keep following. And Cain opened his mouth and began, there was no intercessor. There was nobody to intercede for him. No. This was between him and God. Yes. So here's what he said. 
He said, and Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And then the Lord said, You see, God is a good God. Amen. Now watch it. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him. What's your messenger? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's something fair to you. That was something. You might have a girl. Yeah. He said, he said, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. You see that? And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out of the presence of the Lord and dwelt, dwelt, I want you to underline the word dwelt, dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. How can a vagabond and a fugitive dwell? Yeah. You, you, can, you capture it? You yeah. see this? You follow this? Yeah. He dwell. Now what is what the next one? Verse 17. And Cain knew his wife. How can a vagabond yeah. and a fugitive have enough sense to get a woman? Watch. And she conceived and she bore him and he built a city. I just read that the ground will yield to you his strength. How are you building a city? The curse doesn't have what it takes to be born. Even when the cursor is God. Did you hear what I just said? So if God cursing somebody can be reversed, who in the jail is your so and so who think they put a curse on you that nobody can do? You see what happened here? The man is, a, is supposed to be a fugitive and a vagabond. He's building a city. <laughs> and they're giving you real genesis and oh, you know, genealogy for this man who was supposed to be a cursed man. Yeah. That's why the children of Israel were delivered because of a turnaround. Now hear me, hear me as I begin to tie this thing together. Because I want to bring it home into the area of the generational stuff. So we see that the events in Cain's life, following that, him building a city, him marrying, having a son, tells you that curses upon this earth are temporary. They are temporary. They are all based on the consequential will of God so they can be reversed. So God can repent from his consequential will. And let me say this to you as we tie this together. The ultimate reason, we told you that every curse has a reason behind it. The ultimate reason for curses and disobedience. Yes. That's the ultimate yes. reason yes. that people get cursed. A curse, curse, let shall not come. That's the ultimate reason. Obedience always leads to proof. Yes. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Disobedience always leads to a curse, always leads to iniquity. That's what the Bible says. So it takes obedience then to turn it around. But when obedience comes into place, curses are turned around. And people obey God, curses, I don't care how we came, curses will be turned around. Now, hear me, I want to use this to bring out just the concept of generational curses and then we close, okay? You see, generational curses, all of them put together are all consequential. Every generational curse is consequential. That means it does not have what it takes to be permanent. Therefore, we can break it, we can remove it, we can push it out of your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. Are you following what I'm saying? It does not have what it takes. Now somebody said, what the Bible just said is going to go to the fourth generation. And until it goes to the fourth generation, there's nothing we can do. That's not true. That's not what that scripture is saying. Amen. It's important to understand the scriptures. Understand the scriptures. Generally speaking, when we talk about generational curses, who do we ascribe as putting it on? Don't we normally say the devil? Yes. Because if it's God, why do you want to cast it out? Hello? Yes. If it's God, why do you want to stop it? Yes. Which ones are the ones you want to remove? Is it not the one the devil put on people? Yes. Are you agree with me? Do yes. you agree? Yes. agree with that? Now follow me here. When the Bible said in Deuteronomy chapter 5, I want you to follow me because this is your strength to be able to break every curse. Because if you 
don't know this, you are going to feel you are missing something. You need to know you have to move from a place of strength, not from a place of weakness. Are you getting what I'm talking about? If you don't move from a place of strength, you're going to be in trouble. You want to move from a place of strength. Now, when the Bible says that the curse goes from father to third and fourth generation, and that the blessing goes to a thousand generations, it was comparing. The issue here was not telling you that it is a must that the curse will come on the son once the father was cursed. That's not what the scripture means. No. I'll show you. Follow me. You still with me? Yeah. You get anything out of this so far? Yeah. Stay with me. The focus of those scriptures was to compare the mercies of God with the wrath of God. How many of you know that the scripture said that the wrath of the Lord is brought for the moment? What he said was his mercies and your for It is comparing the mercies of God, which says it will pass on to a thousand generations, to the wrath of God. Because if you read that scripture, that scripture never said the devil would do it. Go back in there, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Um, you see with me? Yes. Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 5. This scripture was not designed to show you that curses always go from generation to generation. They don't always go. If they always go, then we will not be able to deal with them. That's why we can say no more. That's why we can say it not coming here. That's why we can say never. We are not going to tolerate it in this generation. And you know, it doesn't always go. And I'm sure Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now watch this. God is telling them not to carry idols. Then he said in verse 9, Thou shalt not bow thyself unto them, nor serve them. For the Lord thy God, I am a generous God, visiting the iniquity. Who is doing this visiting? Devil. Okay, all right. Did you realize now? So the only generational person that are even important are the ones that God is visiting. <laughs> So I, I don't even want to take on devil and his wishes. Yeah, but that's, that's, yeah, no that's, are you still with me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You can try. And what? Showing mercy. That's the point of this. It's comparing the wrath of God to the mercy of God and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my command. That's what the essence of this scripture is. To compare the wrath of God to the mercy of God. The scriptures show us consistently throughout the 66 books of the Bible. You will see that there is no place in the Bible where the Bible gives you the impression that it always passes from generation to generation. It doesn't have a right to pass. Notice the word was visit. Yeah, 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 no. Very flesh song. Anybody remember the kings, a king called Hezekiah, yes. who was able to deal with the Assyrians, Sennacherib, Rabshakeh, and all that? His son, Hezekiah, did so well. God worked so well with him. His son, Manasseh, was a devil. Yes. Did so bad. Yes. And Manasseh's son, Josiah, was a great man. It didn't pass. Did you see it there? Yeah. You see, you understand the thing there? Yes. It will visit based on open doors. Yeah. Well, you catch it. Yeah. Yeah. it is the door when somebody comes around your house, Apostle Anna, if you open the door to that was coming. That's why the whole thing is you have to learn to lock the door. It's not everybody that knocks on your door, you open to. In some cases, people that ring your bell, you look at the windows and you in your door. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? If you want to know who you are opening the door to, that thing is a visitor. You follow me? You get anything out of this so far? Look at Moses and the children of Israel. Same thing. 
One generation messed up, but the next generation entered the promised land. Very next generation entered the promised land. Then, this is the scripture that people always quote. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the edge of the children's teeth are set on edge. Let us look at that scripture as we try to go Ezekiel chapter 18. I always tell people all the time, learn to read the Bible for yourself. Don't let anybody help you misunderstand it. If you read it for yourself with the Holy Ghost, you will understand it better. Somebody say amen. Yeah. So there is this mindset that once the fathers have eaten sour grapes, the edge of the children's teeth will be set on. I mean, the children's teeth will be set on. Edge. Okay, now read. Here is what the Lord actually said. First one of, of Ezekiel chapter 18. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, What mean ye? God is asking the children of Israel. What shortness are you saying? That in trend, that power. You understand? What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Why are you talking this some kind of shortness of concerning Israel? Why is the shortness of Israel not inside this? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on earth. God said it's a shortness that people talk. Yeah, you, you, you see, you, you read it for yourself. Yes. Read it for yourself. Yes. Now look at the next verse. As I live, saith the Lord, ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Yes. Behold, all souls are mine, and the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son. The soul that sinned, he shall die. Not his son. Not his cousin, not his nene, not his daughter, the soul that sinned in Shadow. You know, you know sometimes, how many of you know that? Have you ever heard the, the statement, the exception and the rule? Yes. Therefore, there is a rule and there's an exception. The rule is the soul that sinned in Shadow. The exception is that something your father did bad could affect you. That is an exception. It is not the rule. So don't embrace it as a rule. It is not a rule. Don't embrace it as a rule. Reject it because you're born again. You have met Jesus Christ, your Lord. Apostle Kenneth George just wrote a new book, it's a true revelation of the new creation. There's no dimension of the new creation that caused that the new creation curse. Amen. The question is, do you want to embrace it? Or you don't want to embrace it? You see, your greatest warfare, which we have time, I wish we had time. But your greatest warfare is not even so much the person of the devil mm -hmm. as much as his devices yes. and the things that he uses yes. on us. Yes. The weapons of our warfare yes. are not come. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of death. No? To the pulling down of principalities. No. No. To the pulling down of wicked spirits. No. No. He said to the pulling down of what? Strongholds. If you read in the original Greek, those are things, set ways yes. that people have chosen, things that they have decided to make, to set in their life. Strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I'm bringing into golden groove maximum security prison. Every thought. Do you understand him? Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says you are in this battle with the devil. He said, make sure that you are not ignorant of his devices. Not ignorant of his person. We all know devil is. Yeah. He said the issue here is his devices. Because the word that is being used, the devices of the devil. The devices. If you study the original Greek, the Greek word for devices is the word noella. And that word noella means the thoughts that he uses. 
So how do we open the door to these things? The thoughts, our thinking pattern, the way we think. What you think about will become a higher thing. What you think about will become your imagination. What you think about will become your stronghold. That's where it comes from. So what the devil uses are thoughts. That is why. That is why. And I'm going to tie this. That like I said, there's so much we can talk about. I really feel that this should be a, like a school of ministry setting. Yeah. Where we take it one after the other and break it down. Yeah. But listen to this and listen to this word. That is why Apostle Anna can minister to you. Bishop Bimbalema can minister to you. Apostle Kenneth Ujirika can come and minister to you. You can bring Benny Hinn and Benny Hinn or anyone <laughs> to come and minister to you. You can bring Ayo Rishet Jaffo. You can take Maurice Cerullo to come over and minister to you. Listen and listen to None of us can make you free. We can set you free. Did you hear what I just said? We can do what? Set you free. But we cannot make you free. You ever read when Jesus said, when an evil spirit has gone out of the man? What did he say? He said, the evil spirit goes to dry places, wandering. When he can't find a place to rest, he comes back. But I thought the evil spirit gone out of the man. Now, Jesus gave that statement after he cast out an evil spirit from somewhere. So, which means the caster out of the evil spirit could have been Jesus. You understand what I'm talking about? But even though Jesus was the caster out, you understand what I'm talking about? The thing came back. He said, if he finds the place clean, he finds the place gone, and then he finds it empty. You can't what I just said. He said, if you tell itself, you see this one? I've got this one. I've got this. I need to go to enter right now. Let me go and get a partner. Come back and get in. The Bible said the latter state of that man will be washed and stones. That means even though Jesus was the caster out. You understand what I'm talking about? The latter state of the man becomes worse. Because Jesus set him free. Are you understanding me? But Jesus cannot make him free by saying, Devil, come out. No, that's not what will make you free eventually. You know how you're going to be made free? John 8, verse 31. He said to the disciples who have believed in him, He said, He said, Continue in my word. Did you capture what he just said? He said, For when you continue in the word, then you will be. My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make make you free. That is why it doesn't matter whether they vomit, they didn't vomit, they did all that, they didn't do all that. If you don't allow them to continue in the world. We will do double work two weeks ago. You understand what I'm talking about? You capture what I'm saying? It is the word that makes them free. You can set them free because you are giving them a jump start. Anybody here ever got a jump start in life? Your battery was dead. Are you going somewhere and your car shut down, the battery gone? You just have to beg people for a jump start. Not so. Now imagine you have a neighbor and every five o'clock in the morning you're now about to go to Port of Spain and then you had to bring your neighbor, you got your, you came out and realized your battery dead. And then you ask your neighbor, neighbor, I want that jump start. So the neighbor gave you a jump start. You understand what I'm talking about? The next day, you come and your neighbor, I want that jump start. <laughs> you must have a watch you cannot. Oh. You understand what I'm talking about? That day, neighbor, I want a jump start. Your neighbor might decide not to sleep in the house. In the because you have to come in a real bird. Or he might leave. When he knows you have come at 5, 4 30, he will leave. Because that's not the way this is designed. It is designed that I can give you a jump start. I want to be able to give you. A jump start. And when I give you that jump start, you take now you take the word. I'm going to get to 
and get into the word for yourself. You understand what I'm talking about? Listen to me. You're not going to have a person I'm at every place that you go. You're not going to have Bishop Ivan at every place that you go. You're not going to have anybody that you respect as a man or woman of God every place that you go. But one thing you can have everywhere is the word. For their life unto them that find it. into all their flesh and stand on the world anywhere and in every place. Yes. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? Yes, yes I'm not going to want to say before I close here. Like I told you, there's so much to say. There's so much to say. Believe you me when I tell you, I have not scratched. <laughs> 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 yes. so, so the things that we know that we are not believe me when I tell you. Are you here? Listen, I, I still feel that I need to say this to you before I go. The devil uses thoughts. That's what he uses. Therefore, it is so important that your mind be renewed the salvation to us. Who you are in Christ. What you have in Christ. What you can do in Christ. That should stand so strong on you. And hear me and hear me good. It does not matter I want, I want to say this. I shock you by saying this. There is no special deliverance minister in the body of Christ. Amen. All believers are called to cast out. Yes. All believers are called to resist the devil. Yes. All believers are called not to give the devil any place. Yes. You hear what I just said? You hear what I just said? So there's no particular special man that must come. And if he does not come, he will be free. There's nothing like that. So you hear me? I said there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. You need to understand that God called every believer to stand against the forces of darkness. However, there's something that we do have called spiritual jurisdiction. I'm sure some of you have seen where people take three hours to cast out one devil. Yeah. There is no precedence for that in scripture. Mm -hmm. If I stay 30 minutes with you and you continue in that mode, you and the devil will leave the place. I don't know. You know what I just said? You and that devil will leave the place. Time three hours for what? Who are you? Who are you that like, must spend three hours on trying to cast out a demon from you? For what reason? I don't what, I'm what happens a lot of times is what we call spiritual jurisdiction. In terms, of, how many of you realize when we go to places they have fencing on houses? Yes. So that means everything within this area belongs to this particular yes. people. Yes. They already tell you no trespassing. Yes. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Any demon that comes within your space of spiritual jurisdiction, yes. are you understanding me? Yes. A demon. Yes. Come, my sister. Full of sin. Come on. I just stand here, just act like you're waiting on something, waiting on something. So just do your own thing. And I come over here, the bus stop, you probably waiting for a taxi. And I come over, you don't know me. I tell you, you don't know me. This not Bishop Pigalana. You don't know me. Okay? You keep doing your own thing, you're waiting for the taxi. Every time you see one, you just try to stop, but they ain't going where you're going. And then suddenly I just come over and I, like, no, 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 you ain't me. <laughs>
Is she having issues to deal with? Because that happens. Yes. For whatever reason. Yes, now we're in need for the man of God to come. Yes. For the woman of God will come. Yes. Because she's feeling weak. That's the only time we are necessary. Yes. She's feeling weak. She's having difficulty to handle it. Could be that she's depressed. It could be that so many things have happened. She just yes. feels I can't fight anymore. Yes. You understand? Yes. So she brings us in. We come. Now into this space. When we come into this space. Anybody ever had surgery before? Before you did that surgery, what did them people do for you in the hospital? Before they take you, they gave you something, there's a piece of paper they gave you. They let you sign a consent. If you didn't sign that consent, no doctor is going to do that surgery. If you didn't sign that consent, they care what's going on with you. Once it's an elective surgery, if it's an emergency, they'll rush in and do whatever they have to do. After that, you need to remember we said jump start emergency and so on. There's place for emergency. We will bring coming to deal with issues. You have to sign a consent. So in the same way, there's a spiritual consent to allow me, to allow Apostle Anna, to allow Apostle Jerica, to allow anybody else into your space to deal with that deal. Are you understanding? If you do not allow that to happen, I don't care how much shout she shout. Yeah. Me ain't care how much bucket or you bring. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. See that demon? Not going nowhere. Because she will love it just so. Yeah. It is in her space. Yeah. And you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. So you are wasting your time and spending five hours. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. You need to ask yourself, does this woman want to be free? Yeah. 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 Like, look within your jurisdiction. You can interfere with people's jurisdiction. That's why we just cause ourselves too much problems. We just go interfering with things nobody invites you to. And then you go home, one child sick, you go this, not for you, but you don't want to interfere with stuff that don't concern you. You know how people that get shoot that ain't part of the fight? You know how people that get punched and have to end up in hospital who were not part of the first fight? Because them want to part a fight. That nobody, when they reach that road, you come to fight, man. Boom! They give you. Are you understanding? Yeah. You need to understand there's a place for spiritual jurisdiction. Yeah. Go and check the people that Jesus dealt with. Yeah. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? Yeah. Therefore, you see, you've read this scripture many times concerning the little girl. The Bible said, you know, this is the way a lot of people read that scripture. And they think they know what the Bible said. The Bible did not say that Apostle Paul saw the girl. And as he saw the girl, the girl started to shout, These are men of God. They have come to do what the apostle said. Shut up, you devil, come out. That did not happen so. The Bible said, This she did many days. Why do you think he ain't interfered? Because when it comes to spiritual jurisdiction and space, don't interfere unless, number one, the person gives you the consent. Number two, the Lord, the Lord through the gifts of the Spirit lead you to get involved. If the Lord ain't lead you to get involved, you will get yourself in trouble because the battle is the Lord. The warfare is yours, but the battle is the Lord. So you don't go interfere in a battle that ain't yours. You catch what I just said? You understand that? Therefore, when I'm getting an issue, issue, and I'm ministering to her, I'm not then saying, you know, this thing looking like it didn't go anywhere. Let's not just say the name of the demon is Guru, and the demon telling me through her, I say, I am Guru, you can't do me nothing, and all that kind of thing, and you're wasting your time. So, what's the other person there? We say, is the only Guru that is there? You're wasting time. You're talking to demons, demons are liars. You need to understand that they're liars. You need to tell Guru, shut up! Or you need to stop Renee, you want to say, shut up, I want to talk to Renee. Renee, and if you say, damn it, Renee, can I talk to you? Shut up, in the name of Jesus. Yeah. 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 This is my space. Yeah. Yeah. This is my house. Yeah. 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 You understand what I'm talking about? And immediately the doctor is going to pull aside, move away and let Renee talk. Yeah. Then I'm going to ask Renee, Renee, you want to be free? Yeah. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. You want to be free? Or you don't want to be free? Yeah. You understand what I'm talking about? Want to be delivered, or you know, you'll be surprised what you will hear. Mm-hmm. In some cases, Renee will not tell you, oh, Bishop, I already showed you, I, 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 you know, 
somebody here recently had a dream. You had a dream where somebody you know that you do good with dealt with you badly in the dream and it confused you. Somebody that you do good with. You are the person I go. But in the dream, it's like you and that person had a major conflict that has been affecting you. Where did that person? And somebody do good very well, but in the dream that you have, that's you, that's it. Come. You had that dream recently, and you and that person did very bad in the dream. It's a deception of the enemy. And, and the, the devil is trying to use that to bring you to the place where you are. You are now going to become very suspicious. You are not going to be able to relate. Are you understand what the devil is allowed? The Bible said that he can appear as an angel of light. What I sense very clearly, and usually the way God deals with me, he, he, he puts me in the situation. So I can minister to the people. Are you getting it? I mean, that happened two days ago. And when I thought about it, it happened. It connected with me for this thing. I don't know when it happened to you. Was it two days ago? So, so, for me, it was two days ago. I think it was. So that means it happened, then I saw it. And you have to find the next thing to come for this thing. That's why. You understand what I'm talking about? So that, that, that I'm trying to show you when it came out of this thing, you understand? There was such a peace on the inside of me that that person didn't do me anything. And that is what I want to relate to. And you understand? No matter how, the devil is trying to create a wedge. Yes, the, the Bible says, follow peace with all you. Follow peace with all you. It is not God trying to warn you that the person is bad. No, it's the enemy trying to put a wedge. Did you catch what I just said? Man? It's the enemy trying to put a wedge. And if God is trying to warn you, He will tell you straight. He won't need to be disturbing you and you can't rest now because of this. No, that's not how God operates. That's not how God operates. Are you following what I'm saying? Let God be God. Let God be God. Are you following what I'm saying? Just push it, God. Just push it. Just push it. Once I respect the grace of God on her life, 
that anointing comes on you. Yes, a strength in about it. Why we are ministering to them? When that anointing comes on me, it will be stronger on me than it is on you. So your breaking will even come faster. The same way, if she was standing in front of her and what it takes to bring her deliverance was a special grace that God gave her. If she's not there, she's going to see somebody across the house that anointing will come from her, rest on her in a stronger way. God does not want any flesh to grow in his presence. So the, the same way, you cannot afford to be in that place and tell yourself, hey, Bishop, you better don't pray for me, I will get my breakthrough. You are allowing flesh to grow. You understand what I'm saying? Well, how do you not allow flesh to look up to God? So it doesn't matter what it is. Whether it's up, 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 because I will be standing in front of you. The glory of God will come upon you from minister to you. And bring your breakthrough in yeah. Jesus' name. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? Yeah. Now lift your hand and worship God and pray just one. Just worship Keep your eyes on Just coming Just coming to God. Just coming to God. Now then says, I want you to aim whoever the Lord puts on your heart. Out of all the things that are standing here, whoever the Lord puts on your heart, and rest on your heart, that's what you should do first. Don't stop us. Somebody in your heart, you just lose your eyes. And it does not matter, it does not matter if somebody is already ministering to that person. Join the person that is ministering to that person. And that in terms of your first person, your first ministration is that person that God put in your heart. She wants God. Alright, so God, allow whoever God puts in your heart. Now we need some people at the altar to assist us.
Hi, I'm Apostle Anna Edwards, prayer to our Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm here inviting you to four powerful services that is happening in the month of August. You don't want to miss it. Destroying satanic covenants. We are standing in the gap for families of Trinidad and Tobago, and we are believing God for complete victory and deliverance over your sons, over your daughters, over your spouses, over your sisters, your brothers, your nieces, your nephews. We are believing God for every evil covenant to be broken off of your life. There's a fire burning at the prayer tower and beloved, it's the fire of God. Everything that the enemy has stolen from you in this season, you got to get it back. And so we're encouraging you, I'm inviting you to join us right here at the World Harvest Prayer Tower, August the 10th, August the 17th, August the 24th, and August the 31st, 2 p.m. And on August the 31st, we culminate with a massive burning service, burning up the works of the devil coming against your life. What's going in the fire? Ritual clothing in the fire. Evil bracelets, it's got to go in the fire. Rings, occultic pictures, in the fire. Books, dust, potions, in the fire. Voodoo head ties, in the fire. Letters, bills, evil contracts, in the fire. The place to be is World Harvest Prayer Tower Headquarters, AVM Plaza, 51 Montrose Main Road in Shogunas, Trinidad. August the 10th, August the 17th, August the 24th and August the 31st. Get to the prayer tower. Your life will never be the same again. Hi, I'm Apostle Anna Edwards, prayer tower Trinidad and Tobago. 
and I'm here inviting you to four powerful services that is happening in the month of August. You don't want to miss it. Destroying Satanic Covenants. <laughs>
going to give him that prayer. Amen. You're going to go back home and I'll give you instructions. The families know who they are. When you come up, come up and get that prayer. Our partnership seed of the month is $625. We want to encourage you to give to the Lord. This is a television network and our broadcast goes around the world. If you want to sow into this ministry, when you come to give your offerings, let me know. And we're going to give you a special envelope. This is your time to connect with us, to partner with us, and to sow into the anointing. $625 is our partnership seed today, and it is a curse-breaking seed based on Judges 6 and 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Gideon, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down your father's altars, and cut down the groves that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God on top of the mountain, in the ordered place, and sacrifice unto the Lord. So that is the curse we can see for this month as a partnership see when you come to give your offerings. You are free to give to the Lord when you come. Just come and let us know and we give you an envelope. Stand up, everyone, lift your arms, lift your tights, people that belong to the spirit.